Good evening, guys. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Hey, Adam G, your online inspirational talk show. For tonight, I have a very special guest. You know, you know, you just don't know how happy I am to be interviewing this beautiful lady as I really have followed her beautiful journey in the pageant scene. You know, I've really followed her. I, I, to be honest, I really got the chance to get to know her on a deeper level during this pandemic when... I was doing a lot of virtual interviews with them when I was still on my previous pageant site. And now, a few years after, she now has finally won her most dream, her most desired crown, which is the Miss Earth Australia crown. And after three attempts, she finally makes it. So I can't wait to catch up with her and talk about her upcoming Miss Earth journey, especially now that it's happening here in Manila very, very soon. So here she is. Please say hello to Miss Earth Australia 2022, Sheridan Mortlock. Hi, Sheridan. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. I'm very excited to be interviewed by Adam today. We've got lots to talk about. <laughs> yes, you know, to be honest, I'm just so happy to be to be finally able to catch up with you and probably reunite as well because it's been what quite a long time since the last time I sp I've spoken with you. I mean, the last time we've spoken, you were just a runner up, <laughs> but now, <laughs> but now look at you. You now have your most desired crown, right? <laughs> yes. I wish you brought your crown. I, it's actually right there. I can grab it if you want me to. Oh no, no worries. <laughs> it, okay. I was just kidding. <laughs> how how have you been, Sherry? Done. I've been wow. good. <laughs> Thank you. Been very busy since I've um since crowning. It's been very exciting. Got lots in the works. Lots happening behind the scenes. Um, so I'm excited to you know once that's all done to be able to share it with everybody. You know, since getting to know you a few years back, I was and you know, learning about your pageant journey, I was wondering when you will do it again. But then <laughs> I didn't realize you did it so soon. Like, so you joined in 2019. You first joined. Uh, you first joined in 2019, and then the year after it was pandemic. So, yes. the uh, the elemental queens got. All, you all elemental queens got shortlisted for the title and Brittany uh, yeah. got appointed for the title. And then the following year, I you didn't, didn't join. No. <laughs> you rested. <laughs> you rested. opted to rest. <laughs> I, I helped out with the organization. I got to interview a lot of the candidates that year, which was really exciting. But I'm like, you know what? This year isn't my time. I was in Wagga Wagga, so not where I grew up. Um, over the pandemic, we got stuck there because of lockdown. And I'm like, my team isn't here. This isn't what I envisioned. So I'm going to give it a rest this year and I'll give it my all next year. And here I am. Which, yeah. So, yeah, I really, you know what? I'm just so happy that you finally bag it. I'm just, <laughs> Thank just you. so happy. You know, because I've already, you know, because I say this because I've already seen the merit if ever you become you know, Miss Australia's next representative to Miss Earth. I remember, oh, this is just, you know, this is no longer off the record. Uh, in 2020, you know, Miss Julieta, when I was still in my, when I was still working uh, in my previous pageant site, um, she asked my opinion, who among the four of you should be appointed after Susanna, right? Susanna was, yes, Susanna yes. won in 2019. That's and I immediately, and immediately told uh, Mom Julieta without batting an eyelash, <laughs> I want, I want her. I want Sheridan. I pay, I, I said, no, I want Sheridan to, to be Susanna's successor. And then, um, why do you think so? She asked me. And then I said, um, it's because she looks like an echo angel. <laughs> and, you know, you know how it is. You know, I've been following Miss Earth for quite some time now, and I noticed there seems to be a trend <laughs> as to how they would like their winners to look like. 
not just physically, but also how they also work behind the scenes, especially with their respective group focuses. And I thought, yeah, and probably, probably because, you know, you remind me so much of Jennifer Hawkins <laughs> a bit. Hopefully that trend continues. <laughs> Do you get that? Or am I the only person who told no, you that? No, a couple of people have said that. I think it's definitely like the blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, Aussie babe type of feel. And, you know, I think we're both just, you know, having a good time. We're trying not to be, you know, too stressed or bogged down, still just enjoy the experience because it's such a unique one. And, you know, there's nothing quite like it. So even though I'm working super, super hard and I'm, you know, putting a lot of, you know, pressure on myself and, you know, wanting to do the best I can. I also just really want to enjoy it because at the end of the day, you know, if I don't end up winning the crown, at least I can say it was a unforgettable experience. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think you're right with your, with your assessment. Yeah. Jennifer Hawkins was really chill and cool when she competed during her time. I yeah. mean, I never saw her as a front runner in the beginning until she came out in her beautiful evening gown during the preliminary competition. And that's where we all got blindsided that, oh, oh no, <laughs> here she is. She has what it takes to win the Miss Universe crown. Yeah. So apart from Jennifer Hawkins, someone is saying here from Gia Morana, who's watching us right now, Taylor Swift in the house. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I see a lot of comments complimenting that you look like Taylor Swift as well. Yes, yeah. I've been getting those since I think the first time somebody ever told me I looked like Taylor Swift I was at a school camp and I was 10, 10 years old. I think I was 10. And that was the first time. And I didn't even know who Taylor Swift was at the time. I'm like, who's that? You know, who's Taylor Swift? But then ever since then, um, it's been Taylor Swift resemblance. And honestly, I love it. Taylor Swift's my favorite artist. My hair used to be much blonder as well. And I had bangs at one stage. So you can imagine the resemblance then. <laughs> so do you plan to sing in the talent <laughs> portion? You know, <laughs> I'm, Earth. Still, <laughs> I'm still figuring that one out because I would love to do like a Taylor Swift cover, but my singing skills just aren't as good as some other skills like i play the piano pretty well but taylor swift songs in particular i don't know what it is about them there's something slightly difficult for my range because she's just super talented but if i practice 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 hopefully i can do a taylor swift song because that would be so funny maybe you could lip sync or probably have a <laughs> tape <laughs> So. Do you like a music video? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, I was just kidding. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just so happy. So on your, you know, looking back, when you won your third, when you finally won your third, I mean, when you finally won on your third attempt, what do you think did the judges see you that they finally gave it to you this time around? I think that definitely they saw somebody that was prepared this time. In 2019, when I first joined the pageant, I, I always tell this story because it's like I had one week, I was a late entrant, and I had no idea really anything about pageants. It was my first proper pageant, and I didn't realize how much preparation went into them. And so this year, I think they saw someone that was prepared, ready to be sent to the Philippines to represent Australia someone that was genuine and had put in the hard work, or at least I hope that's what they saw. So do you think, so do you now believe in the saying third time's a charm? <laughs> I mean, I have to, <laughs> like <laughs> definitely is a famous saying for a reason. So I will stick with it. Have you envisioned that, that in your pageant journey, you will, you know, you will, you will have to go through this kind of, hardship not hardship but you have to go you have to win you have to win your title on your third attempt do you know do you think god was testing you too much for I your think dream? i think that he was waiting i think he's like you know you've got potential when you first did it okay we can see that you're passionate about it there is some potential here and then when 2020 came around i think he was like you know what 
we're going to work on you some more. Brittany deserves this more than you at the moment. So give Brittany the crown, work on yourself some more. And I'm actually very grateful now that I won this year and not previous years because I feel like I've really grown and I've really become prepared. If I had been crowned in 2020, I don't think that, or especially 2019, 2019, I was <laughs> not at all prepared to go to the Philippines. I had like exams and no preparation, but I definitely feel the most prepared and the most at peace and ready with competing this year. So I think it was definitely fate and definitely um, the universe's timing saying, you know, wait, 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 prepare, prepare, prepare. Okay, now you're ready. Give it your all. That's nice. So, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I can understand what you have to go through that, you know, you were still, you still had school then. So you were, you were kind of distracted. You couldn't give your focus, your 100 Absolutely. focus on the, on the competition, right? So now that everything, you know, probably, are you still in school? Yeah, so I've still got two more years of full-time study to go. But what I've done is, so at the start of this year, I was still studying, but July for our second semester of uni, I've actually taken a leave of absence to focus on this pageant because I know that if I didn't give this pageant my all this time, um, like if, if I hadn't won the Miss Earth Australia crown this time, that would have been the end of the Miss Earth chapter for me. I would have been like, you know what? I think that's my sign now to move on. I gave it my all. Um, so for this time, I did a leave of absence for uni because I didn't want to feel any regrets. I didn't want to feel like, oh, what if I had done this or what if I'd done this? So by doing that, I've got, you know, no excuses. I can really give it 100% my time and effort. And so after I uh, go to internationals, if I, if I win the Miss Earth crown, then I'll delay my university studies a bit more. Um, but, you know, if I don't end up winning or placing, then I've still got two more years of full-time study to do, which is what I plan to do next year. Yeah, that's one interesting study in case we really want to, you know, examine your pageant's journey when other people would have um, would have probably finished their school first so that they can finally pursue their dreams uh, right after you uh, you preferred to do it already this year. So how do you know that this is the right time to join? In my mind, this is like... So I believe that, they, you know, the universe presents you doors of opportunity and it's up to you whether or not you open them and walk through them. So university is an opportunity and I love studying and I love what I'm studying and I can't wait to get back to it. But that door is always going to be there. Um, I can always come back to that even 10 years down the line if I so wanted to. Whereas this pageant opportunity, this door was only here for a limited amount of time. So I'm like, you know what? I'll come back to you, university. I love you, but I've got to see what this store has to offer first. Do you think it has also had something to do with, you know, with your age as well? Do you think um, it served you well that you started young? Yes. While you, so... When you joined your first Miss Earth competition so that at least every year you get to improve and improve, whereas probably if you had joined at a later time of your life, you would probably be sort of cramming. <laughs> <laughs> until you yeah. chase your dream car what can you say about it so for those girls for those aspiring beauty queens who would like to join beauty who would like yeah. to make a career out of joining beauty pageants would you encourage them to join as or, as young as they can or would you want or would you advise them to wait it out try to finish their studies first before uh, before they join pageantry based on your experience? I think that, honestly, I think that if I had one in, in 2019 when I was only 19 years old, um, it wouldn't have been as the best performance I could do because over these three years as I've grown not only in my pageant competency but I've also grown as a person, as like a young adult. So I actually would recommend that you do your studies first depending on how long it is and then you do the pageant. I think that 22 is honestly an excellent time to start doing the pageant because I feel like you really know yourself more, which is honestly such a big part of doing a pageant is to know yourself because you will be the one representing whatever organisation it is that you decide. However, in terms of my university studies, it's a really long degree. And so I know, I knew that if 
I had continued with the studies instead of doing the Miss Earth and then coming back to it, it wouldn't have been the same momentum. So it's sort of a case by case situation, but most people's uni degrees are only three, three or four years. So if you finish as soon as high school, get into uni, you're usually graduated by 22. So it's a great time to then get into pageants. Mm, true. So, you know, um, what made you not give up? You know, you won on your third attempt, you know, and let's face it, you could have given up and focus on your school. What made you not give up? Again, it was saying like, never, never, I will try, I will try, I will try. Never say that. I think again, it was sort of that, that opportunity that it presented itself. After I competed in 2019, um, right after I'm like, okay, that was a cool experience. I've dusted my hands of that. Um, you know, I wasn't planning on joining again, but then uh, somebody reached out to me and they said, hey, you know, you've got really great potential. Um, let me train you up and let me, you know, help you become a beauty queen. And so um, again, it was that door of opportunity presented itself. And so I'm like, you know what? Sure, let's do that. So since then I've been training and that sort of was what kept my momentum. That plus obviously my love for the Miss Earth organization and what it stands for. You know, I study global sustainability, which is, you know, it's my whole, it's what I want my whole life to be about pretty much. So after I do finish uni, I want to get into politics to help make those really big changes towards sustainability and really, you know, have that influence because I care so much about the environment that I couldn't do something that wasn't working towards that in my life. I would feel very unfulfilled. Wow. You know, I would have wanted, my next question would have been, why are you so loyal to the brand? And now I get it because you really love taking care of our environment. And it, and it also, it also explains why you finally, why you took up that course, which is global sustainability and politics. So, all right. So, you know, cause yeah, cause you know, let's face it, you know, you're so beautiful and for sure, I don't know how it works there in Australia, but other, other probably pageant systems might be courting you to join their, <laughs> to join their pageant, considering how beautiful you are, but you remain loyal to the Miss Earth brand. That says a lot about your character. Thank you. What makes you so loyal to the brand? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a Taurus and Taurus is a stereotype for being loyal. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, I am just like fully 100% behind what it stands for. Like if I was to join another pageant right now, like if it was universe or world or anything else, I would still want to be advocating for the environment. So, you know, it would still be as if I was doing Miss Earth, but just with another platform. So why not stick with the platform that I'm truly, truly passionate about? Because I care about other causes too as well, of course, but just the environment is the one that I feel is the most, I'm the most passionate about, and I have a lot to say about the topic. <laughs> Someone already commented here, plans. <laughs> have any plans to join Miss, Uni Miss Universe Australia in 2020? He just answered his question. Yeah, so guys, <laughs> he really, she really loves nature. She really loves this topic. And I think she could probably maximize her platform if she were to join Miss Earth, which is really, you know, which really has the environment that is very vocal point for its existence in this world, right? So yeah, I can see Absolutely. it now. Yeah, so- Look, Five the, years, six years down the track, who knows? Maybe I'll do Miss Universe, but right now my whole heart and mind is set on Earth, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, and it really, you know, we can really see it in your eyes, in the way you talk, you really grieve Miss Earth. And, you know, as I read up more about you and you really talk about how you love, you have so much love and care for environment, I wonder, how were you able to develop that genuine love or interest in taking care of our environment? So the environment is something I've always been surrounded with in my life. So my family and I, we lived in Melbourne until I was about eight years old, but nearly every weekend would be traveling to Gerildery, which is a small country town of like 
there's 900 people in the town. It's very small, like one main street. That's where my mum grew up. And so we'd often travel down there on the weekends or in the holidays and camp there. We had a piece of land that was right by a creek. And so we'd always be doing that. We'd always be camping around Australia. So we'd go to the Simpson Desert. And then when I was nine, my family and I actually uprooted all of our lives. We, you know, my mum and dad stopped their jobs and we travelled around Australia in a camper trailer for 14 months. So my two younger brothers and I were homeschooled. And what this experience, I didn't realise at the time, but looking back on it now, it really allowed me and my brothers and my whole family really to see firsthand just how unique and beautiful and diverse our country's landscape is and the environment, the people, just absolutely everything got to experience that firsthand. And so then when we moved to Gerildery afterwards for my high school, I got to grow up in the country as well. So seeing firsthand just how much the environment impacts a small community town with agriculture being the main source of income for that town. We've got many, many farms around. So if there was a drought, you'd feel it in the town. If there were floods, fires, it impacted the whole community. And so that also built up the love and the respect for the environment. And so I knew that in high school, I, I remember watching this video I forget entirely what it was about, but it was emotional and it was about how the earth is struggling. And I just remember feeling that emotion and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like I have to do something. Like I can't just pretend I didn't see that video. I, I have to fight. And so ever since then, I knew that I wanted to make a, a big change in the environment and a positive change and to help save everything that I had seen and experienced as I was growing up. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. So your family was traveling from one place to another. Yes. And so you didn't mind the whole moving part. Like, were you having, were you developing, were you having so many friends along the I way? Because you keep moving from one place to another. So I wonder, how was that? When my family first suggested the idea to me, I'm like, what? I don't want to go live in a tent for a um, year you know I've got all my friends at primary school we're having a good time I like it here but then you know once we got on the road your your family sort of became you became very close so me and my two younger brothers got close and the thing about Australia is even though it's massive there's not a lot of people so we actually ran into a couple of people uh multiple times as we were traveling so um I remember there was this one couple and they had two kids that were my age and my younger brother's age. And so we actually spent about a week together, you know, just hanging out. And the whole culture of camping in Australia here is you make friends everywhere you go. So, you know, everything's open. There's usually communal fireplaces and you just, you know, get to know each other. And, oh, where would you just come from? Where are you traveling to? So I don't remember ever feeling like lonely. Um, but I do remember near the end of the travels, I was missing school. I'm, <laughs> I remember um, my mum has this story where I really wanted to learn Japanese. And so I had a little DSI Japanese game and um, we used to make like sandwiches and I would, with the mayonnaise, write the Japanese characters in the sandwich so that I was, you know, practicing while also preparing my lunch. And so that's when mum knew it was time for me to go back to school. <laughs> For 14 months. So I can see the love, how you got your love for it. Because you know, you know, my 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 Australian uh culture, uh my co my my exposure to Australian culture may be limited because I only get to watch Master Chef and every time they would go outdoor, I would just be so blown away by the scenery, the out, the, the wildlife, the the breathtaking sceneries. Uh your environment no, not your environment, your 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 different places offer outside the city. It's oh yes, there's so much more than just Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Like <laughs> so I can really because you know you could really appreciate nature you know where the birds are chirping and yeah. you know the the breeze of the wind uh the even face. the sounds of <laughs> yeah yeah and they would cook 
behind that beautiful background or you yes. would, i can i could i now get why you fall it why you fell in love with <laughs> with you know you, you with mother nature yeah it's just she was really she likes to put on a show here that's for sure <laughs> Australia, I mean, I feel like the Australian government really knows how to take care of its natural resources. That's what the, well, that's what I'm getting. There's just so much abundance of natural resources, uh, raw materials, raw food materials in that part of your world. I don't care it. Wow. I mean, <laughs> apart from the fact that you, that's why, you know, with all those, with the, all that abundance, and cre- um, with all that abundance, that's why you guys are so creative <laughs> with your dishes. That's what. That's my point is. And now, if I apply it to you, I now get it because you were just so blown away how beautiful the scenery is outdoor of what your country has to offer. So I wonder, you know, well, I can imagine, I can imagine you as a young child, you know, wow, just looking, just being wide-eyed in everything that you were seeing. So as you were traveling with your parents, what is one key environmental lesson that you learned so much from it that you are still applying it now that you are an adult? I don't remember my parents ever teaching directly like an environmental lesson, but I do remember always it being like respect. respect. You, you respect everywhere you go you respect you know the people you respect the environment you respect the animals the plants because without that respect you you can't really truly see how beautiful it is so if you you know respect the journey that an animal may have taken or even just like a flower may have taken just to bloom or a sunrise that's when you truly care and love the environment and just having that love is motivator enough to want to protect it just like you know loving your friend or loving your family you care and you respect them and so of course you'll do anything to protect them if they're in danger and so definitely the respect is a key thing that my parents have taught me that has then transferred over to an environmental or eco sense so is that the reason why you took up why you're taking up global sustainability in yes, politics. that's definitely that's a heavy influence. Double degree, yeah. Double. Politics. That's why it takes twice as long now. <laughs> yeah. So wow, you're so you're very passionate about it. Super yeah. passionate. It's my whole life. <laughs> so, for the benefit of my viewers who may not know what the course is all about, so what is yes. a, what what can you become out of taking that course? Global that's sustainability. Okay. So, global sustainability. You learn. It's part of an international relations degree, so it's one branch of it. So you could either do like the UN or you could do global sustainability. And so what we learn in that class, for instance, is on a a global scale, how do things like the coal industry affect us? How does global warming affect us? Uh, The Indigenous peoples of lands, you know, what role do they play with the protection and the fight with climate change just really asking and digging into all of those moral questions all of those questions about what action should we take and what will happen and what's happening now and what will happen if we don't do anything so really just learning and absorbing all of that and then the politics side of course is learning about our government and how it works and you know all different systems that are happening in our day-to-day lives that is making change and so by combining those two together my two my two loves (laughs) i then want to be able to afterwards get into politics um to start you know fighting for what i believe is right fight for australians also because i you know i don't just care about the environment it's my number one thing but you know i love australia and i love our people i love how multifaceted and multicultural we are and so just to be able to help everybody and help those that I can and then if I can somehow become minister for the environment uh, that would be my dream job I could call I could die happy you know after I've done done my work obviously um so with that degree that's sort of really what I'm hoping because by having that expertise about the global sustainability and everything I've learned from that I think can really help push me into that sector so can you equate from basing from what you said can you equate sustainability from 
um, in the environmental context, for, um, is it the same thing as taking taking action on climate change with the way you just answered a while ago? Yeah, yeah. So sustainability is, it's not really an action word. It's more of like a describing word, I would say. So climate action is, in my mind, you know, you're acting towards saving the climate. You know, you've, you're doing things or you've done things or you're advocating for things to help protect our environment. Whereas sustainability is like doing something in a way that is sustainable. So that doesn't always have to have eco or environmental connotations. Um, it could just simply be like, you know, having a sustainable lifestyle for you. So you're not overworking yourself. You're not getting burnt out. And I think that uh, a good overlap between the two is not everything that is environmentally sustainable is sustainable in, you know, the social media's eyes. So we see things like zero waste. We see things like, you know, try to walk as much as possible. Don't drive your car. Use public transport. Uh, you should never buy fast fashion. You should never buy anything with plastic in it. It goes on and on and on. But sometimes those things themselves aren't sustainable for your lifestyle. So if you can do those things, that's amazing. And that's just a really, really great effort and uh, like keep it up. But for everybody, that's not sustainable, especially when you're looking at, for instance, there's, you know, the pay gap and, you know, there's poverty and people that are rich. A lot of our zero waste options are more expensive. So we can't expect people already doing hard to then not buy the $2 pasta wrapped in plastic compared to the $6 pasta in a glass jar. Um, we really have to look at tackling the climate change crisis sustainably so that it works for everybody, so that it's fair and it's equitable because, you know, if everybody is fighting for it together, then we'll make real change. But if everybody is so focused on their own thing and making sure that they don't produce plastic or they don't do this or don't do this or don't do this, you get very trapped in what you're doing as an individual, but you can make more impact if you can let some of those things go so that you have more headspace to work together and make a big impact, if that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you for enlightening us about it. Because uh, for me, uh, on my, if you'll ask me, I've because if you'll always ask, because I've always thought that when you when you talk about the word sustainability, especially in in the environmental context, it's always about zero waste. Yeah, that's zero not carbon sustainable blocks. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to be. But, I remember in my early years of high school, uh, my late years of high school, and even beginning of university. I was so in that mindset of I can't use any plastic, I can never use a takeaway cup. And I just got so worried about it that I was, you know, promoting, not promoting, but contributing to climate change and climate warming um, that I just was draining myself thinking about all those small actions in my day that it really didn't make a big impact. And I'd get so annoyed when I saw somebody else using plastic because I'm like, don't you know, you know, you're destroying the earth. But then I realized that individually, you know, the society that we're in at the moment, there's not much you can do. You can't avoid plastic realistically, yeah. you know. And if we all realize that, you know, it's only by changing it at the top that it will trickle down and make it easier for us to be sustainable in an environmental context, then uh, we can do make bigger leaps uh, with helping the environment. So definitely... Just, you know, be sustainable with what you can do. Don't try to push yourself too much so that you're in your head about it. I think what you're saying, you're you're also taking into consideration are about the impact that we could generate for the for for our environment. So I wonder why is it important for us people to consider our individual impact on this planet? Yes. So it's still super important, you know, even what I said, it's still super important that you are at least aware of the impact, you know, if there are things that you can do that are easy for you and your lifestyle to help the planet, please do those, you know, if it's, 
if bringing a reusable water bottle everywhere is something that you can do easily, do that. If you can take more public transport, do that. You don't have to do it all, but just doing a little something helps, especially things such as supporting small businesses. I think that the biggest one for me is stop buying from fast fashion brands if you can. Um, there are so many other alternatives for that. So many other alternatives that like you really don't need to be buying from, you know, fast fashion places that are just producing and producing and producing. We already have so many, so many clothes, so many textiles already in production. Go to your op shop, Facebook marketplace, borrow from friends or, you know, neighbors or, you know, help support those small businesses which are trying to do sustainable um, so in terms of like the fast fashion and things, that's something that I think that nearly everybody can do. Um, so, you know, just with your personal life, you know, what will work for you. And I think it is important that we all do something, but it doesn't have to be everything. Ouch. Avoid fast, fast, fashion. <laughs> I don't think I can live with that, especially if there's a clearance sale on Zara. <gasps> Well, the thing is, though, cost. like so I purchase from Zara every now and then too, right? <laughs> but I make conscience, conscious choices. So, like, if I do purchase something, I know that I will be wearing that for the next five, six years. It's not something that you purchase, wear once or twice, and then throw away. You know, it's not necessarily that fast fashion is bad. It's just the whole thing around it where people buy it and then throw it out, buy it, then throw it out. If you buy it and keep it for like five, six years, Ah, doing oh, good. Okay. if you know you're going to wear that 60, 70, 80 times, then it's not fast fashion because you've slowed it down in a sense. Oh, that's, oh, I thought when you talk about fast fashion, you always buy what's on trend on in that store. And well, that's the it. problem is with buying on trend. Regardless of how long you throw it out. wear it. Yeah. So like if a trend cycle is short, then people usually buy it, wear it once, throw it out. But if you really, really love that trend and you know you're going to wear it a then million it, times, then it's not fast for you. You know, you can wear it multiple oh. times. <laughs> oh, thank you for thank you for enlightening me yeah, again yeah. about it. Because, I, yeah, thank you. Wow. I'm learning so much <laughs> from this interview. So if you love that Zara shirt, you get that shirt because you know you're going to wear it 100 times. It's a good shirt. <laughs> so since we're talking about fast fashion now, now in this interview, so my next question will be, what do you think does a sustainable lifestyle look like in this year for the year 2022 or even beyond? So this is a hard one to ask because, again, it comes down to individual people and their experiences. But for me, I think that a sustainable lifestyle right now for people to have is just to become more educated on the topic. It doesn't necessarily have to be actions. There are a lot you can do, and I'm sure we've all heard them by now, you know, try not to use plastic straws, plastic bags, the list goes on. Um, but by being educated or learning a bit more about it or just getting involved with, you know, helping to spread the word about it, more people start to listen and those that can do something big like organizations and businesses and government will then start to change their narrative because they're feeling the push and the pressure from the people that they want change as well. So I think just stay educated um, and find, find that reconnection with nature again, you know, find that love for the earth and spend some time in nature, just really ground yourself in it. I think that that's sort of the most sustainable thing that you can be doing. That's true. So, we're with, so based from your answer, if someone were to ask your advice how to live a more sustainable life or how to live more sustainably, where do you think they can start? I think definitely start by looking at your lifestyle and seeing where you can switch things out that have an impact on the environment. So my first one would probably be the easiest one is switch from a plastic toothbrush to a bamboo toothbrush. Uh, that's the easiest one. Nearly everybody can do that. Uh, second, uh, bring a reusable water bottle with you and fill that up if you're in a country that you can do that. Because um, obviously not every single country has safe running water. So if that's the case, that's not the sustainable option for you. Another one, again, the fast fashion and reusable coffee cups they're just such an easy one that's why everybody loves talking about it because it's something that you can do 
nearly everywhere in the world, you know. So I think start with those three and then just keep being aware of when you're throwing things in the bin, like, oh, was this plastic something that I could avoid or can I, you know, use something else next time and also purchases. Um, when you're purchasing things, if you're a big online shopper or you're a big spender, like just going out and shopping for things, I think maybe just slow down a bit, think about it first, because there's nothing worse than when you buy something in the moment and then you get home and you're like, why did I buy that? <laughs> and then that's just created some waste in the landfill somewhere. So be conscious. That's it. Be conscious with your choices and your decisions. Um, and that will follow through with your sustainability. Listening to your answer, being conscious, you should be conscious of your decisions. And some of the decisions that you enumerated or listed um, involve sacrifices, you know, <laughs> switching the bamboo stick from the usual one and some some uh, and and the, and other similar things. So people like me might wonder, why should I make sacrifices if I don't see my let's say neighbor mm -hmm. do it or is not doing it? That's a hard one because that's often why many people who are start their environmental journeys then give up because they feel it's unfair. They're like, why why should I have to sacrifice something when nobody else seems to be doing anything? And to that, I would say, you know, that's when I say reconnect with the environment again, because no matter what other people are doing, if you're doing something that you truly believe in and care about, then it won't matter. And maybe you can even try and influence your neighbor. Hey, you know, so I just switched toothbrushes from a plastic to a bamboo. It made nearly zero impact in my life, but it will help the environment. Why don't you give it a go, you know, and just by reconnecting and rooting yourself, reminding yourself how much you love nature, whether it be you might really love flowers, for instance, or you might love a certain animal, or you might simply just love the ocean. Just reminding yourself that these things are special and that they deserve to be protected. And so it's worth making those sacrifices because of the love that you have for the environment. Do you think there will ever come a time that do you think sustainable living Will become the norm will become the norm or practice in our society what do you think will it take for sustainable living to become the norm that's my last I question i really truly believe that it is possible i think that to see that however it will have to be a global effort so it can't just be one country doing it well and the rest doing it poorly i think there will have to be a lot of teamwork and collaboration especially on the political level because a lot of political legislation can protect environments such as you know wetlands or animals or beautiful things such as that and you know if we don't see those things anymore we lose that connection again with the land so I think it needs to start at the top and then trickle down because the people at the top really have a lot of influence and power and if other people see that, then they will also try to make change in their life and lead a more sustainable lifestyle. I agree. I agree. So, wow. Guys, so look, she's really amazing. She really walks the talk. She really breathes everything about nature and environment. Wow. I think do you I think you will really do well in the upcoming competition because everything that you've been saying. It's not a put on. It's not just a facade. You really know what you're saying. So you've done so many things for environment that worth that is worth taking a second look at. And hopefully, the Miss Earth organization very very soon. <laughs> Once you set foot here in Manila, we can't wait to finally see you in person. I'm so and excited! Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be a dream. It's gonna be so stressful, but it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, are you excited to meet your fellow candidates, to meet all your yeah. your fans here in Manila? I'm so excited. I've just I feel like I've been dreaming of it for three years since I first did it, and now it's finally happening. Happening. It doesn't even feel like I'm going to be going to the Philippines yet. I feel like I just wake up and I'll suddenly be there, and it will be happening. <laughs> yeah, I'm just glad that our country is now open to tourists. So, for Miss Earth to finally happen. <laughs> Yeah, so exciting. There's a question here from Mr. Pageantry, Mr. Australia. 
Can I ask who's your greatest opponent for the Miss Earth 2022 crown? Ooh. And why? <laughs> to Have be you been honest, keeping tabs of your No, I try so. not to. I don't really want to, um, you know, psych myself out or anything. I can't wait to meet them all in person and chat with them and just become best of friends. But um, I've sort of been too busy to really give the other girls pages a stalk. I only see them every now and then when I'm on Instagram or somebody's done another hot pics and I'm like, oh, these these are familiar faces, you know, but don't know yet. You you tell me who's my greatest opponent and and why. <laughs> Colombia, because they're, they're as Colombia. equally as hungry as you are <laughs> in winning the Miss, their first Miss Earth crowd. Who knows who else? I don't know if Venezuela has crowned their delegate yet. Then Puerto Rico. Oh, there's one. Kosovo. Yeah. I like Kosovo? her. And her yeah. Kosovo, yeah. What is it called? Yeah. Yeah. Check her out. She's so beautiful. She really, well, the moment I saw her photos and her resume online, like wow, wow. <laughs> and then uh, and then before we end, there's another comment here from Kevin Ryan. I can hear the new Miss Earth Queen speaking in her. Thank you so much for your immeasurable love for the environment. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Immeasurable. <laughs> so beautiful, Miss Earth Australia. Oh my God. Hi, Queen. Such Hi, a beauty Angela. from that. <laughs> oh, you know her? Yeah, I know. She was um she was rooting for me before I even won the Miss Earth Australia crown. So thank you for your continued support. <laughs> Oh, Angela, there's a huge chance you might finally see her in person as the pageant of death will finally be held here on site, <laughs> live in the flesh, where we all can watch a real pageant again. So we can't wait for that. Such a beauty from land down under. First crown for Australia. Yeah, I see it. That's I really plan. see it. <laughs> Who knows? You could be the first, right? You know, you I mean, got we so had Nina up. We had Nina. So now it's time for the winning crown. <laughs> yeah, and Diana, I think. She was also a runner-up back in 2015. So there you go. There you go, Sheridan. Thank you so, so much thank for you. gracing this interview. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and effort in doing this interview. God bless you. I really can't wait to finally see you in person in Mount Julieta. Will you also be, will they also be bringing Mark, Sir Mark? Yes, yes. I think the whole, oh, I think he wants to, but he's trying to figure out if he can come or not because I think he's got other commitments, but oh. most of the team will be coming. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> it's really worth the trip because if you'll be checking out the leaderboards right now, everyone has you as part of their top four so Thank i hope you, you can sustain the momentum all the way until i don't know november 30 that's of coronation night 27 is it 27 or 30 oh 27 oh yeah 27? somewhere it around that Sunday. yeah that time yeah so thank you so 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 much thank you for I having me lots of fun i can't i can't wait to see you soon my gosh finally <laughs> call it perfect timing call it right timing you're gonna be competing at a time where I mean, where, you know, uh, live audiences are now allowed to watch events, like live events like Miss Earth. So thank you I'm so, so much. I'm so excited. <laughs> so okay, as my last question, can you give a message to all your fans and supporters yes. eagerly anticipating you as early as now to come here to the Philippines for Miss Earth? Thank you, everybody, so, so much for all of your support so far and for everybody that's following my journey and sending me love. It really does mean the world. And I really am very much looking forward to doing you all proud on the stage in the Philippines. I can't wait. And I hope that you'll all be cheering for me on the final night. <laughs> uh, can't wait. On that note, thank you again. I had such a blast catching up with you. Send my regards to both mom julieta and sir mark tell them i miss them so much yeah hope to see them in the flesh as well when you compete here in miss earth so god bless you take care virtual hugs and kisses all the way from my office here in manila Mwah. take care <laughs> bye, bye. Thanks.